from Wakefield, it's the Nolan Car Night Show. By Andrew and Nolan's guest this week, John Philip Chanel for the show. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the show. And joining me this week is, is someone who's who's done it all in the music industry. He was a performer. He played with people like the Beach Boys. He is a recorder. He is a conductor. He is someone who composes music. He does everything in the music business that he, he can do. <laughs> His talent is amazing, much more talent than myself when I was much younger. He is the one all the way from sunny Southern California. John, Philip, Chanel, how are you today, sir? Great. Great. Warm. Well, yes, I think it is warm. It is a little warm even in here. But sure. Yeah, it's good. You can't complain. You know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of making making the sun stay out and the weather be as warm as it can until it gets cold. And although California, you don't get snow, you, you, you may get brush fires and big forest type fires. Um, I run, well, you get the fires and sadly, yeah. um, you know, it's, uh, you can't ever be prepared for it because sure. it just gets drier and drier and yeah. everything. But, you know, as far as the snow thing, if you drive literally probably about 20 miles north of wow. here, once you get past that, that, that mountain range up to the north of Los Angeles, I mean, if you're in the winter, you will see something that you would think you were in Colorado. I mean, wow. like a dry Colorado, like sure. this you know snow on the mountains i mean you still have desert with no yeah. snow but i mean it's it's pretty amazing that, that you could live here and you could go surfing in one sure. end you could literally go skiing you know yeah, it's, it's 50 hard, miles. hard to hard to fathom in that situation we could go as south as you can and it's blazing hot and you got Cali southern california <laughs> la and then you got sacramento where in fresno oh god yeah yeah it's, it's insane it's i have not been to la but i i, I would love to get one point because that's a place where obviously a lot of history has been made not just historically but music. there's a lot yeah there's a lot of i mean you could go down different pathways here in los angeles and spend you know months sure checking out stuff <laughs> as we talked before we got going here and sort of you know throughout this in, entire weird time we've been in you, your profession music has been really affected by these crazy and wild times and now things are looking a little bit better you never know with monkey pox out there you never know what could happen but for you at, at this point two years into this where things are starting to get better how's it been for you um the the very f well my my father passed away that year like yeah. within literally i was on the plane coming back from taking care of my father's business in march and i came back and the door was closed to Canada. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, literally that day, I landed in Los Angeles and, you know, they, they suspended for the next, I don't know how long it was, like six months. But it was a, it, that whole period of time from the end of 19, 2019. I, I mean, I can't even explain. I, can't, I don't even know if I can explain the, the transitions and the revelations and the sorrows and all those things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is been quite a slice of history sure. and 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 everyone shared it this yeah. is what's you know this this was like um it was pretty uh, phenomenal and it, i think it was a i think for the people lucky enough to have a spiritual journey through this we all did but you know recognizing it is another sure you had the opportunity to to grow up and some of us did and some of us didn't. I mean, you know, the condition of the country at this point in time is the result of, yeah. uh, how, how dare I say, perception. Yes. We can leave it at that. Yes, <laughs> very <laughs> much so. But yeah, so so basically during this time, um, I, uh, I continue to work because, you know, for me, in a way, I've always worked from my studio. So, you know, since about 19... 90 towards the through the 90s it began i got more and more work through that working with european artists working with people in their own studio it just became more convenient to, to use high-speed internet to exchange files exchange sure. recordings um and some people are even which i haven't gone to but some people are even doing it in real time sure. over the internet but that's a dicey sure. situation but um so i've continued to work i've continued to write um and uh you know it's it reflect yeah, uh sure. you know like as everyone else has done um you know you say well what am i doing here yeah what what is it that really we began to find our passions yeah you know uh we we began to find things that we um we loved and we forgot we loved and then we'd rediscovered again sure. new loves uh 
you know, it, it's, man, what a time, it, it's just a time of, of both things, sure. both tough, you know, hardcore stuff on one end and, you know, spiritual stuff on the other and good things on the other. Sure. So it's, it's pretty hard to say I didn't, I've always, I've always wanted to participate in life. I like doing that. You know, as a musician, we write about it. We experience it. We're, we tend to be kind of fearless. As Many of us tend to be fearless as far as that goes. So in a way, it was kind of like a nurturing, weirdly nutrient-filled sure. <laughs> experience. Uh, but I'm glad it's over or ending. Sure. Because you know, we haven't been able to associate with each other. Sure. Um, yeah. So, well, I'm, I'm sure I would. And I was going to mention that for, for you to be working, you know, from your studio and file sharing and in, in the moment, be able to do it electronically super fast h- helps you maybe accept or not accept it, but be able to withstand all this a little easier than those who really weren't able to handle it and really had a hard time adjusting to it. Oh, my God. I mean, I had friends that they just ended like the department of an accounting company or something, you know, 50 people or fired yeah you know or i mean let go laid off uh and thank god that you know there was some money coming in i mean literally the the united states government basically (laughs) kept people alive yeah i mean it just wasn't completely you know i mean there were problems but overall i mean it was um quite a and and people in general people came to help people you know hey move in with me do you know do all you know here's some food you know i mean again it was like a a wonderful time for people to exercise their humanity sure and and many most i think came up to that sure which is kind of impressive i think for for you as you mentioned a time to reflect and find new things you have interests what did what did john you being yourself learn about you that you didn't know prior um to the pandemic I don't know where I don't know where to begin. <laughs> it's like um, I learned. I always thought that I was stable, and I mean that not meant well mentally too, but <laughs> but, in, but in terms of uh, of, of uh, you know a calm perception. Sure. And and I realized that that I intellectually I was, but not. Uh, uh, physically or emotionally. In other words, I wasn't, sure. I mean, I was, I was intellectually in that space, but I, I'd not practiced it. And I, sure. I think that between my father's passing and, and having to deal with that shock and coming to grips with it and becoming, in other words, it was a period of time to be present. Sure. And that's what I learned as opposed to an intellectual exercise sure. that became an actual exercise sure. in being present. And it's, it's it's profound how things chronologically occurred, multiple things that we don't have to get into, but it just was this thing that said, you're going to grow up <laughs> <laughs> for once in your life. Well, you know, not, I'm, yeah. I'm exaggerating, but, you know, it was kind of, and I didn't even know I needed to. Sure. So, yeah, that that was a big deal. And the other thing was that I realized that whatever preconceived notions I had of my music or other people's music, I realized I got to a more fundamental state sure. that allowed me to perceive not only myself. Well, I mean, I had worked in that period of time since the beginning of 2020, I've worked on two or three really, dis- well, two s- s- incredibly decisive records uh, and incredibly rich one with with Tori Amos and Ocean to Ocean. And um, well, actually in that period of time, the album hasn't been released, but uh, a, a, a band, an artist, uh, Michael McQuart, who has a band called Bad Thing, A Bad Thing. And um, it, it won a, actually a Grammy in 2020, uh-huh. uh, Savior did. But that's not the record we were working on. We were this new one that hasn't come out yet. But these two are very profound records in the sense that they were not afraid to be unique. They weren't afraid to draw on unusual emotional and narrative stories. Uh, and it was like, I'm 
you know, I'm fine. That's, sure. that's that, you know, I can do this for the rest of my life. Sure. This is exactly what, uh, you know, as a child listening to records and completely reading the album sure. cover notes and going off into other lands, I'm doing that now. Sure. Even though I have done great records all along, but there just seems to be an interconnect between sure. me and my, and my performance, my arranging, the people that I'm working with. So there's kind of a zeitgeist that sure. I'm living in that um, uh, I think is part, it's a, there's a long-term thing here, but this is kind of like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is now we're here. This is, yeah. this is the new, new place to be. Sure. So. We talked at the beginning before talking about this, you know, being a fan of the Beach Boys music and the enterprise that they have become over the last now 60 years. And you just mentioned again, listening to music, delving into them and taking all in, sort of knowing where you, you, you should be. You're growing up in, in, in Canada, cold Canada, in a family of music and engulfing yourself in it. Does that, you know, whether it be your family or just, you know, listening to music, what played a role in, in, in your thinking or your understanding and acceptance of music is where I need to be and that's the only thing I'm going to be able, able to do? Really young. Um, I started writing music when I was five. I mean, silly, silly yeah. things. Not I was not Mozart <laughs> or Benjamin Britten for that matter. But my parents, are, there was always musical instruments and music around and they gave me a huge set of, of kids records that was actually all classical country uh you name it and right. funny things you know with characters in it and stuff made for kids sure. but some of it was very traditional some of it was possible traditional so they gave me that early on i was five or six when they gave me that they gave me my own record player wow. and you know it started there and by the time i was 12 i was playing the piano and imitating things and in high school, I spent four years imitating classical music and writing my own compositions that imitated the things that I loved. So the thing, but, but the universal thing about this is emotions because what, these, what this music did was it took my mind into a completely different place without actually moving anywhere. I could sit in a room or I could sit somewhere, listen to this music and immediately be taken, transformed. And pretty much... All music does that. Some music I prefer not to go where they're going. But, <laughs> sure. but you know, and, and that was it. And crying. Sure. And, and just the emotions coming out. And I got to a point where I started playing music and I wanted to express these emotions. Sure. And I wanted other people to, to understand these things. I, I, I mean, I was hoping this sure. would happen. Yeah. And as time went on, it, it happened sure you know i mean talk about being lucky yeah and right. i think that's what that was a primary thing that was the primary motive was this emotional compact with with the music brian wilson his story is is known that he was he wrote surfer girl at 19 years old in the car without any sort of materials on him and then remembers oh. it and goes back to the studio and does it which is <laughs> phenomenal and my dad laughs that every time i tell him that but do you think that, and he was, you know, learning piano at a young age, mother teaching him on the table, learning how to play piano boogie woogie, as David Marks was saying. But do you think his ability to write music at a young age and put all together at a young age it connects to you and, and you being able to write music oh, and put stuff together at a young age? That's an interesting point. I mean, you know, my relationship with Brian, he it was a it a it was a better time for him, but it was a difficult time for him. Sure. Um, I always, I, we didn't speak much. And, sure. you know, he would even, when I, when he would, he would ask for me to come into the studio in the period of time I was working because he was working on something, he would, you know, because I had introduced this new Oberheim uh, synthesizer, this Oberheim 8 voice, which was unique at the time, um, uh, SEM, uh, big, big old beast. And I brought it into the to to the group, you know, into the touring because yeah. I wanted to, you know, uh, add sounds and stuff. And and all, you know, ultimately the goal. This is silly, and Michael Andreas hates me for this, but <laughs> it was to replace the horn section. <laughs> and it was like I always thought, are you really sure you want to do this? <laughs> I mean, 
I won't say who suggested this in the band, but nonetheless, it's someone who wants to save money. I'll leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> tends to do that. Sure. Um, but anyways, we all got canned anyway, so it's sure. fine. I feel I feel camaraderie with the horn section sure, when they yeah. left. Um, because that, that, that was the, I think at the point where Carly, me and Sterling, uh, left, sure. um, for financial reasons. So, yeah. um, but, but anyways, that's not, not yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Sure, it's all yeah. good. I'm totally happy for what happened, but, sure. but I always felt a camaraderie with Brian and, and he would, he would, Oh, I was going to say, so the management would leave a message on my phone to say, you know, Brian, like you tomorrow morning at nine or wherever. And they'd say, they, he, they would specifically say they want Mr. Oberheimer. Wow. His nickname, he would never call me by name. He sure. would call me Mr. Oberheimer. Wow. <laughs> he was the name of the synthesizer, sure. right? I thought that was like, yeah. And, sure. and it was just, it was great. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, this guy's thinking differently about stuff. So yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> well, it's a unique situation and to bond of, of that nature to you and, Michael shared sort of the same situation, his path through music and how he was able to connect him. Because as, as you mentioned, it's a, a correct uh, thing. Obviously, you were there, but it's a tough time for the band in, in the late 70s and in, in the mid 70s. And we were worried about him not showing. Sure. You know, not, well, he, he ended up showing up, but sometimes like there was one show where he was playing the bass and they just threw the bass down and then Carter picked it up, which, sure. by the way, let's talk about. I mean, at some point, we'll talk about Carter. Yes. He's like brilliant multi-instrumentalist guy i just hate him these military interest instrumentalists i have enough time have problem enough playing the piano <laughs> i hate him <laughs> uh, we'll get to the, eventually more into the beach boys later but before that though was there were they on your vision or or, or play in terms of musical um eating or was were, was that maybe a little before you or, or after you they were not on the main they were not on my main thing my main thing was like prog and rock and stones and stuff like that uh, I, I mean besides classical and other things but um but there were a couple of songs that start, uh, really i always absolutely adore and that was god only knows yeah and to a certain extent good vibrations but but really, for me, for my background, God only knows it's a is a brilliant piece of music. Sure. Because it contains so many kind of mid romantic or I mean, I identified it because of the classical aspect sure. of it. And some of those movements where, you know, it's a two chord to a, a first inversion like a G7 to E. But the root is moving uh, A to F sharp, and then yeah. the parallel, the planing of the six four, you know, the six four chords linking sure. between sections. Absolutely brilliant. But I know where he got it. I mean, not I don't know where he got those specific things, but it is a coincidence. Here's yeah. another coincidence that his theory teacher was my theory teacher, what wow. my his music history teacher. Wow. So he went. He took theory from. Oops, can't remember his name, but at um, El Camino. Sure. And later on, after I went to uh, Northridge, I I went to um, I whatever. We won't talk about Northridge because I went on the road, and that was the end of yeah. it. So <laughs> ten years later, um, I went back to get theory classes, and it was a particular thing, uh, Shankarian analysis. Uh, but it just so happens my mystery, my history teacher at that time, not my theory teacher, but my history teacher at that wow. time was his theory teacher, sure. and. I can get it. I understand because I understand the way this professor taught. I could totally see that Brian was inspired by that. Sure. And especially in that song, in terms of the way the romantic period was, he really, that that's impressive. Well, anyone that, anyone that puts together writes and produces a song that makes Paul McCartney cry and, and say it's his favorite oh, song ever. It, oh, it is good enough as it is. Oh, uh, 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 there you go. Yeah, you're back at that. And, and also the thing is, is that, you know, and Carl, excuse me, I mean, that voice. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, even till the I, end. Oh, and wait till you hear when you hear that. When I heard that live, I mean, I was like on the I, I, that song brought me close to tears sure. almost every time we did it. Um, it was the one song that for me just represent it really. I think it ultimately rep more so than the the 
the the surf stuff and all that. Sure. That song represents truly the 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 universal quality of the Beach Boys. Sure. I mean, in all genres, I think that 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 and it and it. I think it covers. I think everybody would agree sure. with that, no matter what style of music you like. Well, and, and speaking of Carl, which we'll also get to later, the, the thing about him that is amazing is, is that from 62 till 98, there was no change, difference to his voice, maybe besides the engineers <laughs> on the mask. That's, that's a good and, observation. And, 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 and there's, yes. there are some videos at the end of, of his time here on planet Earth in the 90s, one of his last few concerts, and he comes out on stage, it's only audio, where he's saying God only knows, and I can hear music, and it still sounds the exact same thing as it oh. was 30 plus years ago, and you, you give him credit for his saying that, and for Brian to say, you know what, I can't do this, but Carl, you try it, and Carl's 15 at the time singing that song, it's like, is he was, really? He was 15 or 16, I think, when he joined. Holy cow. I was, I was, I was, I was just getting my first summer job by, by the time he was, he was uh, singing that, but that's, that's a whole oh. other thing, um, Oh man! You you mentioned in a in an interview I think it was they called DIY music a few years ago. Uh, it was on oh, YouTube right, or whatever. Right, right. And you, you talked about and uh, speaking of your your family and music, how although your your parents may not have had a high level education past maybe tenth grade, that you you really thought highly of that, and they were very conversationalist and high you know thinkers in that situation do you think that experience that they went through educationally gave you a better appreciation of the work it went to early on when you're playing music uh that's a good question i never i never made the distinction because the the fact is even though i was always surrounded by brilliance as a child sure it it was just not scholastic sure and i have a lot of people i mean not a lot of people but i've had people tell me well you know, I just don't really know anything about music. I don't know whether I'm a great musician. And this is this usually comes from an artist that's brilliant, right? Sure. <laughs> but he said, yeah, I wish I knew more. I said, well, it, it, it's just a tool. Sure. It, education. And it, it includes, I think, everything. I, I, I mean, it would... It's Look, at obviously, there's things that you need specific education in, like heart surgery and stuff like that. But when it comes to the arts... Um, there's something that's even more intrinsically important. First, I mean, a couple of things like passion, incredible yeah. passion, and that passion will bring you through the hardest of times. And then the other thing is to do some, you, you have to create a language, sure. which some people learn in school, but you can also learn this by experimentation, by composing, by trial and error, which is a longer, and I don't mean, and I'm not putting that lower than education. I'm just saying, it's a different, it's a different way to get there, but in the end, when people, let's say, music, I'm speaking specifically in music now. Music was a, a people with a, an artist. Well, how do I say this? A person who goes through music education does not guarantee that you will be creating great stuff at the end, unless it's coupled with that thing. Sure. Whatever that thing that we have that makes us create things that communicate on the flip side someone who is just you know going through it i mean willie deville is a great example i produced him i was very close friends with him and he was a you know he was a savant you know i mean he had a struggling life killer just incredible but when it came to music he was just so dedicated to it. His communication skills were difficult to, to <laughs> figure out, but I personally, I, I bonded with him like he was my, the alternate brother, you know, I mean, we, sure. we, we bond and we had, we created a language for ourselves. He creates a language for his musicians. He's found them. So, so he wasn't, he was totally uneducated. Listen, he grew up in a box. Wow. He lived in, on the, the, you know, during the Andy Warhol time, he was like on the streets in New York yeah. City. This is this this guy is a natural. Uh, he was a natural musician. He ended he, his life ended too soon, as far as I'm concerned. But he, um, uh, but but that, that said, so it's a combination of two things. Sure. It's, if you can, you you create this organization in your brain. Humans are just brilliant at that of creating their own languages to work things out sure. as a creative being. And so, and, and that if there's nothing wrong with getting theory, because that helps you too. I mean, my God, I analyze, you know, 20th century music. I mean, you know, that's part of my groove too, but I don't let it, 
it doesn't interfere with my other sure. it's, all it is is kind of like well these are kind of exercises but now here's music and yeah. it has nothing to do with that yeah. except it does it can influence so you get all your these influences in i'm completely blown your topic because i can't sure. remember what the original <laughs> your original question oh no 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 worries um un unlike today or uh, unlike you know years ago nowadays it's very easy i think to get a lot of su success in terms of online attention and views and likes and all that stuff to get your product out there compared to maybe years ago maybe when you were first starting where there's no there's no tiktok there's no oh my YouTube, god all that stuff. so you're going through a lot of hardships like anything else but music that's a a big example if school wasn't an option and wasn't the option how did you wrap around yourself to say, okay, if I'm going music full force, I better just accept what's going to happen before I get to the, that golden spot in, in success? I think, I, you know, I think back at that period of time, like uh, the, 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 so officially around 1970, that's officially where out of the house, on my own, you know, Sure. A musician. Well, I went to school. I went to Northridge for two years and then, then quit and went on the road. But I eventually found, but the key here is that, you know, for my generation, we were able to play and learn. We were able to earn a living. You know, my first real, you're, you, I mean, I'm not bragging or anything no, sure, because sure. It's, 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 it's just a silly number. But I was making back in my first major commercial band was making the equivalent of today's dollars, $2,000 a week. Wow. I mean, it was three seventy-five at the time, but equivalency. Wow. And that number was a top end of a club, a club band, a cover sure. band, a club band. But yet all these musicians in my generation, or generations, you know, in and around my generation, were able to actually be be a musician <laughs> you know and it was uh, and that was a golden time in the 80s it began to completely change sure. and now with the internet it's really different yeah so i mean look at that's why i'm very grateful because i grew up at a particular time that allowed me to you know if it wasn't that i would have probably been a physicist because <laughs> that was my first major sure so, you know, would I be happy? Probably not. The reason I didn't <laughs> want to do it is because I'm one of those guys. I'm very selfish. I need instant gratification. Sure. I can't wait 20 years to find out that my theory was completely bullshit. Sure. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Who would? <laughs> I need it now. <laughs> yes. And nothing, nothing wrong about it at, at all. So, you know, I mean, but, but I always look, I feel so sad because I mean, every time I, 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 I talk to a young musician, I, I mean, my basic thing is, look at, go to school, get a job that you can support, that you can halfway endure and play your ass off. Sure. Because I mean, I don't see what the other alternative is. I mean, I, at least that's something that you have to do early on later on, you know, you'll eventually build into if you're still into it if you continue to be into it you're you'll build into a career um but i always i mean everybody i've gotten consultations from parents of friends of mine you know say hey talk to my kid brilliant kids but i i, I that's i it doesn't make any difference sure it, there's just no i mean and you mentioned the internet the internet is not you're 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 gaining you're gaining gaining presence but you're not making them living sure and, you know, I hate to be grandpa, which I am, <laughs> but needless to say, I hate to be a grandpa about it. But, you know, it's that thing about be smart, manage your money, figure stuff out. It's a much more critical time than it was sure. during the time of David Bowie. Yeah. Although, you know. Better music. It, 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 <laughs> we won't go into that. <laughs> but, um, you know, he's... I mean, I think about it, and, and that's the one thing I wish was different. I wish there were more live gigs. I mean, listen, I'm playing in a live gig now uh, with a band because I, I love playing live, you know, to get me out of my brain. Sure. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's lovely. Great musicians. Uh, the bass player played with um, 
um, not Bonnie Raitt. I keep, uh, anyways, never mind. Sure. Great roots player. All of them have credits, you know. Uh, we open for other bands at, at the, country, the, the um, uh, uh, Canyon Clubs in Los Angeles. And it's a decent amount of money, even sure. if, in, in, for now. And I get to play and I get to study back stuff that I ignored, you know, back in the 70s. Sure. Oh, well, I'm a hot shit play, yeah. piano player. I can play that. And I would. But then when you listen back, that's that's what's the most amazing thing. If you look at listen back to the Beach Boys and you listen back, you know, everybody plays the Beach Boys. Everybody does this and this and whatever it is. But if you look back and really listen to what's going on on the stuff that was even now, if you really use a critical ear and not use preconceived notions of what's going on, you will hear that most creative stuff and stuff that you enjoy, there's a lot more to it on, than on first listening. Sure. And that's what I'm experiencing, that going back to the 70s and kind of picking up like Nicky Hopkins stuff, even though I worked with them, you know, Nicky Hopkins piano playing was one of my primal things. And I'm going back now and listening to it, maybe because I'm older and a grandpa. <laughs> uh, I'm listening back and I'm going, oh, that's what's going on. So anyways, yeah. So I do wish I wish there were more club gigs for everyone sure. to just get their, you know, yeah, yeah, on. There's a man who who played with who plays with Brian now and who played with the Beach West on two separate occasions, Gary Griffin. Who oh who, right, who, who, I never ran into him. I never met. Yeah. Well, I, I think I might have met him once. He, well, he had mentioned and he when I had him interviewed him and he's mentioned in other interviews how he knew from a kid that he was always going to be working with the Beach Boys and that that was going to be his gig. And now obviously he has oh, worked well, with Brian. Wow. And for, for you, though, at, at that when you're now successful before joining the Beach Boys, was there any in, inkling that, hey, maybe I'll, I'm getting closer to working with them? Or was it just they had maybe reached out to you and, and you said, yeah, sure, I'll work well, with you? Well, the, the situation, well, again, everything in music has a weird, what do you call, lineage or whatever, sure. start. Um, Cheryl Bianchi, who worked with Mike Love, uh, uh, as his assistant is one of my oldest well is my old literally my oldest friend hmm. we were four we, i was 15 and she was 14 when we met and we were we've been friends ever since and she was uh she was the one who introduced me in in, in uh what do you call it whatever how, tm she sure. she was yeah. my tm teacher <sighs> so um uh so years went by you know this it was like 1969, 68, I was in high school. And, you know, we're friends and she doing her modeling thing and coming back around. Eventually she was working with the Beach Boys in the late, uh, not the Beach Boys, but um, Mike. Yeah. For Mike's love thing. So Cher said, well, what do you do? And Mike loves looking for a keyboard player and you're a TMer and he wants PMers in the band. And I said, fine. Sure. And so I met him up at his, his compound up in uh, Santa Barbara and we talked and sure you know and I, well, I and, and you know i told him i was into synths and you know i'm exploring all these new things and stuff and he was interested in it nothing sure. didn't hear anything and about six months later uh uh i forgot how it, i think cheryl called me and said well mike wants to uh get you in the beach boys so can you leave in <laughs> a couple <laughs> of days sure which is, no, which yeah. is always easy yeah. to do no, no problem. Yeah. You know, and well, and well, the, the good thing is that I didn't have to bring any gear when I first sure. went there. I mean, they've got like, they're, they're, they've got like three wallets or pianos <laughs> just sitting there just in case one of them breaks down. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen, well, later I did see, I was in a band that had way more cases, but nonetheless, it, they had all the gear and everything you needed. They were set up for me because that was Gary, the keyboard player, I replaced? I don't know. I know he was there on the MIU album, and then that was the only piece that he had worked with, I think, with the Beach Boys. And I know that was near the end of the 70s. I, I think, I think, I think when it, yeah, I think that, yes, I think something happened like in 77 because the MIU album was talked about, but somehow I never, I, I, I think some of the stuff I did ended up there, but sure. I, I don't. I never knew what was really going on. Sure. Because when you're working with five principles, they're kind of like, or four, how many? You're kind of. Sure, yeah. 
spread out, you know, and, and so I, I literally, I'm on the plane with a cassette listening to Beach Boys music because I really didn't know anything. Sure. I mean, and, you know, and I got through that first concert. So here's a kid, you know, a, a LA boy, you know, <laughs> going, you know, who, who's only played clubs, yeah. some significant ones in, you know, around the United States, big ones, but I, the curtain opens up to my rig after we did one rehearsal and then like opens up to my rig. There's 80,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's a difference. Like, I, I was like, okay <laughs> yeah that, that's that makes you do it fast and, I, and i've asked i've asked other people who have played at the beach boys over the last couple of decades of how they react to that because that's different going from and i asked this to bobby figaro and a guy who had been there in the late another guy had been there in the late 90s about oh, yeah. going from a small situation to then going to something like a queen mary or a a fourth uh, of july concert where there's tens of thousands of people there, oh yeah thousand people there and you have to sort of just play along and not let that affect you. Because if you do, Carl Wilson's going to say, hit the road, my friend. You're, you're done with the, the band because you can't, we, we can't have that. Well, that's interesting you said that because after that concert, Dennis Wilson came up to me and said, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and I hadn't even met him yet. This is the yeah. first words out of his mouth. And I said, well, Dennis, I... I found out it was coming here two days ago, and there's like a shitload of songs. Sure. You know, I mean, literally, I'm telling you, I, this is, dude. Yeah. And so, and so I said, man, I'm studying as best as I can. And he said, okay. And he left. I mean, I remember this in the hallway. I left. And after that, we became the best of friends. Sure. I mean, it was like, you know, I loved him because he was, he was more the rock and roll sure. dude, like, there was no exactly you know, other thing there were no other things involved there was, sure. even though we had more baggage he had less baggage emotionally in yes. certain respects i i have asked this as well to all those who have played with the beach boys and, and trying out for them and what it was like but also there's a thing that happened that i've been told about and learned about that happened during shows that if you messed up on a on a chord or part of the song Carl Wilson would look back and give you the Carl Wilson stare. And if it happened once and that he's like, ask you what's going on. Second time you look back third time you're done. So when you were on stage with the beach boys, was there any situation of that nature where Carl's like looking at you in terms of not playing right. Or was your classical background sort of helping you with the type of progressions and sort of other stuff in the songs? Wow. That's a, now I got to think about like, did he ever look at me? Yeah. You know, he may have, now that you think, now that I think about it, I always saw him facing out. Sure. Kind of looking in general around on the stage. Yeah. I mean, if he, it could have been, he might have done it once or twice. Sure. He might have done it once or twice, but I can't, I can't guarantee. I mean, sure. I wasn't, I wasn't even, you know, I mean, I was basically in this, if you, I don't <laughs> know if you've ever seen what it would, what, what we, the, yeah, and closing this. So you had Sterling on piano or yeah. the pianist on piano. Sometimes Brian would do that. There'd be an extra whirly on stage that Sterling would play or Brian would play sometimes if he's playing a song that's whirly and him singing. Yeah. And then there's I know, whirly is a whirl. It's electric piano. Okay. Um, and then you have Carly next to me. We were always together, which was funny, <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny as hell exchanging messages. And he, um, and he would play Strictly Hammond, which he superb. Uh, all of that he had down, and I had kind of the uh, extra accoutrement, so to speak. You know, the 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 um, Ben uh, Portamento um, synthesizer in good good vibrations, and you know, strings and string ensemble, and a couple of solo instruments and all that. Um, so I was surrounded by that, and that's really what I was concentrating on. I mean. I don't know what it's like to be able to just enjoy an audience because as a synthesis in a band, I'm asked to do all the parts <laughs> that are, you know, the the French horn that comes here, the thing that comes here, the thing sure. that I mean, it's like you really don't get a chance to feel that rock and roll sure. experience because <laughs> your brain yeah. is constantly working. I'm being 
somewhat facetious, but it would be great to play in a band. And I and I've told everyone this. I said, look, it, I want to play in a band where there's an acoustic piano and a Hammond. That's all. Sure. That's all I'll play. And I did. I actually did that with the Four Strangers, the the band that uh, we did all half the music in Sons of Anarchy. Oh. Um, when we went on the road. That's what go. I did. Yeah. And, and it was really and it was exactly how I thought it was fluid and beautiful and just natural. And I savored the audience. I felt participation. Sure. You know, it's, it's a very interesting thing because, the, the, you know, as a synthesis, synthesis tend to be it's a, a lot of mental, sure. which are called a, to do live. That is, oh. I mean, on, in the studio, it's a whole different thing. But it's just you're called upon to know a lot sure when when you were with the beach boys at that point i don't know specifically if maybe dennis was working on his solo album and, and correct me if i'm correct me in, in, in the this, second the in, second in, solo record yes yeah, uh, uh bamboo that was after or what has been bamboo after pacific yeah. Ocean, which is a, a brilliant album in it's oh my god um, i, I can't at, talk about it enough at, at that point though when you're with the beach boys and if you had worked on any al- albums with the the beach boys yeah. What was what was your viewpoint on Dennis's solo work, and would that would you have hoped that that would have been where they progressed to next at, at that point in their career? I don't know whether I w- would have ever thought Dennis was an outlier in the greatest sense of the word, and his records, and even the record before, really pointed to a new direction in music. And he pointed to what came in the 80s eventually. You know, you had the, the proto alt music, David and David, and various bands that were really beginning to go into this much more art, artful experience, which it had been in the previous decade, sure. earlier in the decade. Um, right. Well, there's always, listen, there's always been great art music, but, <laughs> but it just, it, it be, became a full force. So ultimately, when alternative came in, it was it was full on sure. experimental and art arty, and sometimes very good and sometimes crappy. But that's sure. every you know every genre is like that. Um, and Dennis really that's what impressed me about Dennis when we were in Criterion. That was the first time I get. Well, maybe there was one other time, but it was the first time we were there for two weeks or something, a week or two weeks. And when I when we after one of the sessions, Dennis said, "Hey, come over. We're in the studio next door." And I pl- and, he, and I oh geez, I can't remember what it was, but it was some beautiful atmospheric thing. I, I think I played some Mogan, and I think Sterling was there and Carly. Um, and I, I was just flabbergasted sure. because it was like this is like oh, this is this is yeah. great. This is I mean it's something I I would do. I mean it's sure. something that I would want to do and be part of. And um, I, you know, I love Dennis. I, I think that he, you know, given the right, yeah, uh, maybe not doing a couple of the wrong decisions yes. that he made, you know, removing yeah. some of those, I think he would be with us today and he would be recognized as being, you know, a, a very sure. formidable composer. Sure. Um, besides, I loved his voice. Yeah. I mean, his voice was like not. <laughs> It's not yeah. like anybody else is in the band. Well, there's a there's a song on <coughs> Pacific Ocean Blue. It's not too late. There's a song on Pacific Ocean Blue. It's not too late, which I believe he wrote with Carly. And at that point, Dennis's voice was a little bit more gravelly. So Carl comes in and sings a lot of the parts he can't sing. It's, it's such a beautiful song on, on, oh, I'll that, listen to that. on that album because it, it's so great. And as you said, you know, a few things were different. If a few different choices were made, it could have been a whole right. different situation and one of the best and the C and I believe it was in 2008 they'd come out with some magazine r- write up and it was I think Dennis's album was voted like the best album of whatever they whatever the situation was because they had packaged both in two two together and to and it, it was good you know in the sense that his kids are, are here and to have been able to experience to say hey I might not have uh, been able to see that in person back then but to experience it but it, it's such a a, a great thing to to see and experience and such a a, a wonderful musician the true rocker of of, of the group and the definition of music right. because even till the end still you know banging away sweating profusely and just all <laughs> all out of it and it just a and a nice person as well even if he had his his, his vices as yeah. um 
as well. After the Beach Boys and you know, you you working with you know you're working as you said Sons Sons of Anarchy, working in film scoring and and, and TV scoring, but also you worked with as you mentioned Tori Amos. And that that realm of music, what's it like not only to work with her for the last you know couple of decades, but also to be working in film scoring and television scoring to success? It seems, well, it seems that it, it's a, in a way, it's a natural progression because film film scoring, working with film, I mean, even though, even if it's not an underscore classic style, orchestra style thing, or, you know, it could be a song score and all that. Um, in, in that, in again, you're dealing with emotions and you're dealing with narrative, which seems to be a recurring pattern for me, you know, to enjoy it. Um, in fact, if I get a song from an artist that 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 um, that has a, a bland narrative and they don't even know what they're doing, I will invent one. <laughs> I invent the cinema. So I mean, I had a Japanese project come in, a pop project. Um, really talented people but they basically gave me a dx7 piano sound and uh, you know playing chords and somebody humming wow 12 rep 12 songs like that <laughs> yeah. and i was supposed to arrange them wow so i got really good at inventing a imaginary narrative sure. for that and it was really, and I was going, you know, you know, bugged by everything. And later on, I realized I, that was the greatest education I ever had. Sure. Because it really, it really, I think that that, and, but to make a long story short, that, that's basically why I like film. The problem with film, and I'm kind of reconciled, I'm getting reconciled with me in film, is that I, I, I tend to like to spend time on stuff and the, I have not rectified. I, maybe I'm starting to, I don't know. I, I haven't rectified that time frame. Sure. Um, I mean, so far it's been successful, but I'm just, um, I've only met a few directors that I really like. I hate to say this, this is probably <laughs> ending my, my film career um, because I have to go for some kind of, I mean, it's, I, I, it's not easy for me to deal with just a peripheral kind of, sure. well, here's the story and blah, 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 blah. It, it, much like pop music, you know, even though I was greatly successful in pop music in the eighties, I, eh, after a while, it's like, yeah, but I need, it, it's like it should be meaty. It's like sure. I need something that's, you know, conflict oriented or expansion oriented or something that means something, you know, a love song that just basically says, and then a couple of hoots and a couple of choruses, it's not fulfilling, yeah. you know, sure. and, and I did that in the 80s and, and it was fine. And I and ironically enough, it was a very lucrative time for me, but as soon yeah. as I went off the rail and went into the indie and the, you know, alternative thing and on and on and on into whatever self gratification again, there sure. you go. Um, <laughs> it became, I became much happier. Sure. And, you know, maybe a little lighter in the bank, but, you know, nonetheless, I, but more work. Sure. I mean, it, it, it's there, you know, yeah. again, you know, we make our choices. Exactly. And hopefully they're good choices and you just move on and ignore all the bullshit around. Just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and what people are telling you and all that, because if you're getting off and you're, you're feeling good about what's going exactly. on and what you're doing, you can conquer exactly. anything. Yeah. Well, and I, that, you know, brings up a good point. And that's why I, I take a liking to you more. And it's a situation not to brag about myself, but as you said, with, with your sure. self indulgence that, that, that you've had with your work and quality, it's still like this. Granted, I, I had, I'm not going to say names because I don't want to get in trouble, but there, there was a person, <laughs> there was a person one time who I had. Listen, I'm trying not to get in trouble sure. for this whole two hours. Yes. So just, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yes. Um, <laughs> but there was, there was someone who I, I had on here who, um, had on they just asked when we were talking over the phone beforehand about oh what the statistics were and how many people i had subscribed to air and that viewpoint was like that and i said well it may not be a whole lot but the thing is i enjoy heck out of doing it and um being productive because i think it's not just oh well you did this and you didn't did this and then you went to this point that's you know boring to me it, it's still i want to you know <laughs> jump off a short bridge after doing that right, i'm asking right. questions more specific ones that get more out of it even if i'm not getting 
a, a, a lot of uh, you know, fan support from it, but it's still giving me a passion and enthusiasm about it because you're, you're enjoying the process and you're enjoying the creative output in this. And you get to talk to people like my, my guest today, Mr. John, about <laughs> his life and his experiences, how he's passionate um, about this stuff. But I, I mentioned uh, Tori at, at the beginning of the um, question and, and sort of you've been working with her for a while now. And a man that also comes to mind when thinking about long-term collaborations is John Hanlon, who was with the Beach Boys in the 70s, working oh, with stuff right. like that. And yeah. he's worked with um, Neil Young and Crazy Horace over the last couple of decades and their partnership. For you, though, to work with Tori in, in this arena and to be doing it with her so long, what's that like for you in terms of putting music out, but then also be on the same wavelength and what needs to be done for that piece of music? Well, Tori is kind of a, a, an unusual situation, I think. Maybe not so unusual. Maybe people don't talk about it, but we really are close. I mean, close in, 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 in the sense that um, musically. I mean, she is moving in a similar direction than I'm moving sure. in. So every time we come together, it's... You know, I mean, it's not exactly in sync, but you know what I'm saying? So when we see each other, we understand, sure. oh, okay, I, yeah, yeah, I get that. And also we're very experimental. So, you know, we take chances and, you know, it's, um, I'm in the process of, all, all I can say is I'm in the process of, of, of some creative things with her right now. And it's very interesting because, again, in terms of the, the pandemic topic, um, I see in her that that this is a process that sure. we've, what we've talked about this is the process what's happening here and now coming together again it's like oh man this is like what massive this is like this is amazing i mean you know it's just i i, I some of the i it's some all i can say is it's sure it's an absolute synergy grooving thing and um the, the other the flip side of that is it makes it difficult sure. because I have to guarantee that what I'm doing is the absolute best thing and not something that I'm preconceived because sure. we know each other. I, it's easy to preconceive things. So you have to keep yourself open. Sure. You know, when you have a relationship with someone for a long time, they'll say two words and you end it, but that's not necessarily the ending of the word, the, sure. the sentence. It, it's yeah. there may be something else coming sure. out and you don't let it happen. Sure. So that that's that's the really tricky part is to uh, but am I hearing this is this exactly what it is how can this be extended beyond what we normally sure. would could do and and um and so far you know cross whatever's so far we've been able to I think manage to do that over the decades is sure. you know continually to expand um and 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 challenge each other sure i think that might be the 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 key here so i mean i i had a kind of a similar relationship with willie but um willie deville but um his thing was a completely different sure. there was a there was he he thrived on um uh conflict sure <laughs> so that it's a, that's that would be a whole other <laughs> subject yeah i mean lovingly but sure you know but yeah, Tor, it's it's an interesting thing because the, the thing that we have to remember is that everyone has to be allowed to change. Sure. And and we have to recognize that. And and it and it, it's proved sometimes to be very difficult, especially as an example with a couple of a couple who has known each other for a long time. Um, it, it kind of stifles expansion because you're sure. just assuming, well, that's how you're going to react. Yeah. As opposed to just being present and saying, you know, hey, <laughs> what about <laughs> this? Sure. You've over the course of, of your uh, successful career in music, you, you've had a lot of success, you know, whether it be the uh, being part of Grammy nominated albums or songs and uh, re gold records and the things of that nature, top 40 singles and that sort of stuff. And then working on uh, Sons of Anarchy and all that uh, fun jazz, looking at it fo going forward, is there something that you would like to try to accomplish before you, you close up shop in, in the music realm? 
You mean when they close the coffin? Oh, no, um, oh, uh, I mean, I, 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 guess, <laughs> I mean, but that's about, of, I'm, I'm yes. hoping that kind of is about it. It's yes. like as my hand will be coming out of the yes. coffin and there'll be a pencil yes. and I'll be writing a, the last sure. note. Sure. And then they say, okay, fine. Sure. Uh, but yeah, something that you, you hope to accomplish or you haven't done before that you would say, oh, that'd be cool to, you know, try to, try to uh, take a whack at. Oh, you're talking about something that I haven't done. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, there's hmm, there are things that I used to want to do like years ago, but I'm kind of doing what I want to do. Sure, <laughs> that's a that's a good question. I mean, I would just do more. Sure. Like, you know, um, oh, oh no, there is something I want to do. Oh. That shows you that I put it in a little box sure. and I don't take it out often <laughs> enough. So I've been writing screenplays and well, I've got two of them and one of them, one of them is I think pretty significant. But the thing is I wrote the screenplay because I, at the time I wanted to write more film music and um, you know, I was mostly doing records. So I started writing a screenplay and writing the music at the same time. <laughs> and I can't really, anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a futuristic multi-time frame thing. Sure. Um, uh, not, yeah, um, about a savant girl. All right. uh, I mean, a brilliant girl that it, it becomes the, okay. I'll, I'll just give you a brief. No, never mind. I can't do it. I can't say it because if I tell you what this is, it's like somebody's going to listen to it and sure. and take it. But but nonetheless, it, it, it's but it was a vehicle for me to write film music. So I'm writing the music as I'm doing the screenplay. Sure. I'm writing lines to the screenplay. So this scene would be this would be the music to it, and that's what I want to do. Sure. And I, it, it it it's very possible that it could happen. I mean, the people that I know who are associated with the film industry, when they hear the, the, the one sheet, you know, the basic premise of the whole thing, they're pretty flabbergasted. Sure. So, and this is something I keep putting off because, you know, it's like, that's not my, I have a day gig. Yes. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have to keep yeah. myself alive, but yeah. it's sitting there and I, I, I work on it every occasionally. And then even Tori, when I explained it to her, she said, oh, Phil, this is your, you you gotta do this yeah. so that would be it i mean i think that that would be the last kind of thing and and sure. you know I, I i am attached to the screenplay but i wouldn't write you know obviously this is something that has to go into you know a sure. writer's hand yeah but um you know uh I just have to apply myself to it. I mean, I think sure. I think I know who to take it to. I just, you know, you have to yeah. you have to do it. Sure. You can't sit over. You can't yeah. keep doing it over lunch yes. with a guy and say, "Hey, I got this great idea." Yeah, you I mean, you to... could. It's not that kind of thing, though. So. Sure, you don't want. I mean, maybe you do, but you don't want it to be like Brian Wilson's Smile Project, where it takes you all this time to get it out there for them people to enjoy. Oh my! But... Oh shit! That's another thing. That yeah. album is amazing. Yeah. A, a brilliant thing and so and uh, to be honest with you you know I, nothing against it bright genius that he is with the various stages he was musically writing um i it, when i first heard about because i kind of got more into the beach boys when i was in, in college before i graduated recently but you know I'm, I, I'm a fan of some of the stuff that's on you know dance's album obviously sunflowers a few things on the la light album good time and one of my favorite yeah. songs oh that's an interesting time. song yeah uh, i like that one too one of my favorites that brian doesn't play nowadays and then recently, because David Leaf, who has worked with Brian for years and sort of helped him get Smile back out there, I had was like, I'll just listen to us because I was going to interview him in the next few weeks. And I sat and listened to it. And I was like, oh, this is better than, you know, this is pretty good, better than I thought, because I knew of the stories and what was happening when it first was going, putting together in the late 60s and early 70s and sort of, the, you know, the fire um, tape and all that, oh, right. that went into it. And I was like, eh, I don't know if I'll get to it. But time of uh, i don't know if i'll give the time of day but then i did and to then see you know brian finally release his tension in his shoulders and finally let that happen and the, the love that he got from it and to sort of give him the confidence back again it's 
amazing. And uh, I'm sure that that gave him a, a sort of ability to breathe in. So whenever you get your screenplay out there and you, your, your thing together and it wins all the awards that it can be, I'll be looking forward to seeing that. Um, before we, 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 we say, uh, as, they, as Porky the Pig says, that's all, folks. I, I want to thank you again for, <laughs> for, for, for doing this because this has been a, a true treat for me to hear a musical mind oh. like yourself because, to me, I, I only played saxophone for a quick second in middle school, and that was, oh. that was it. Um, but I want to end on a little segment called the One Word Challenge. So in this segment, I thought a few names, places, or people, or things that my guest okay. has some connection to and needs to do his best to yeah, yeah. say a word to that comes to mind. So, John, are you ready? Okay. Yes. Uh, Toronto. Cold. Los Angeles. Warm. Uh, the Beach Boys. Uh, complicated. Tori Amos. Ooh, I love her. Classical music. I love classical music. Rock and roll. I love rock and roll. And last but certainly never least in, in this universe, John Philip Chanel. I love him. <laughs> Well, as I said, this has been a blast and for you to, to open up your mind and your cranium and, and share your musical adventures and, and thoughts on this whole crazy world. By the way, wait, retreat. wait, no, you said sax. I, yes, tried sax. I tried sax for about two months practicing up in the liquor room above a bar <laughs> that I was playing in. And the waitresses finally said, either you shut up or we're quitting. <laughs> So that's my story. Well, I, I it's had a typical like, instrument. Yes. When I was in middle school, you had to, you know, in order to go to the next grade or whatever it was, it's a silly thing. You had to take a music class, whether it be, you know, learning piano and, you know, sure. uh, learning musical history yeah. where it was. And then it was also learning an instrument. And I, you know, never practiced besides who let the dogs out on the reed piece. And then, <laughs> and that was that. I, I, I'll tell you a funny story quickly before we say goodbye that on um i don't know if it's fourth of july no it's fourth of july it was uh a parade for end of the school year or being the school year and we go through the town through our main street and play instruments as i said never a practice so i was like please no i don't want this to happen please i'm not ready for this i don't want to do this and luckily luckily it rained and i said thank the heavens above me because i didn't want to do that and i returned it of course my parents weren't too happy because they wasted uh, a couple hundred dollars but i digress no, no. I, i'm still I in my place Yes, I, sim um, I sympathize with you. You it, did a good thing. Like I said with, with my guest today, is, um, when he gets a screenplay and wins all the awards, if you like what you watch, subscribe, follow, share, comment, all that fun jazz yeah. because it helps it grow. And down the line when he wins another Grammy or <laughs> so, so another award for his well-deserved work, you're going to say, holy crap, this is amazing. So do us a favor, do that. Follow on Twitter, oh, Nolan Cart Night, and Instagram, Nolan Cart Night Show. John, is there anything that you would like to share, put, put, put out there, plug, promote that you have coming out or be out in the near future? That you can share <laughs> no i can't <laughs> there's no there's some well oh no uh well i don't know the name of the record out a bad thing check out right. bad thing a bad thing sure um and michael marquardt sure. uh uh he has a new record out the last one he did was uh, lifelike and this one is uh is going to be great it's a well, cool record in the words of the dean of the tonight show johnny carson i bid you a heartfelt good night so we see you again take care